Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Kevin McLaughlin, Dean of the Faculty at Brown, and I'd like to thank you all for taking the time uh, this afternoon to attend this important forum on human trafficking. You can turn your cell phones off now. Brown's educational legacy has been built upon the central tenet of freedom, freedom to pursue knowledge, freedom to think creatively, and the ability to use these skills to help others achieve freedom for themselves. On the basis of this underlying mission, the university's faculty, students, and alumni have been working for decades to combat the continuing problem of modern day slavery on both the national and international level. The kind of work they've done and continue to do regarding this issue contributes to the broader goal that Brown has identified of using education, political influence, and community action to create more just and peaceful societies. This is indeed a major theme, as many of you know, within our strategic plan, uh, building on distinction, a new plan for Brown. And today's conversation will serve to illuminate some of the challenges that stand in the way of this goal and how we can combat it as, a, as global citizens. Our panelists today include Catherine Chan from 2002, who serves as Senior Advisor on Trafficking in Persons at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As a student at Brown, Catherine co-founded the Polaris Project, a now international nonprofit organization that provides victim services, policy advising, and strengthened community responses to human trafficking. Malika Sadasar, 92, is executive director of Rights for Girls and a renowned advocate for the safety and security of vulnerable women, girls, and families. She has been recognized for her leadership in shutting down Craigslist advertising that served as a lead leading method for trafficking children and for helping to end the practice of shackling pregnant mothers who were in US prisons. Finally, we are pleased to welcome Preston Tisdale. He's got lots of dates behind his name. Uh, uh, first of all, 73, and then it looks like four children who've either been in med school, three children uh, uh, at Brown or as undergraduates. Uh, Mr. Tisdale is an attorney who has served as the Director of Special Public Defenders for the State of Connecticut and the head of the Fairfield Judicial District's Public Defender's Office. He has amassed both an extensive trial resume as a public defender and an outstanding track record of service and adv advocacy related to racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system, hate crimes, prosecution, and child and youth development. Today's discussion will be led by Anthony Bogues, the Lynn Cross Professor of Social Sciences and Critical Theory in the Department of Africana Studies and the Director of the Center, the inaugural Director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown. I hope this, that this will be an enlightening conversation for us all, and I'll now turn the pr program over to Professor Bogues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean McLaughlin, and uh, let me add my uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, particular panel discussion on uh, the enduring legacies of slavery, human trafficking in the 21st century. There are, by some estimates, reliable estimates, 27 million people who are in the world today who are in some form of human bondage of this 27 million persons, uh, one million uh, of them are children exploited by the global commercial sex trade. 70% uh, of the female victims who are trafficked are trafficked into the commercial uh, sex industries. And then the, indus the entire industry of these 27 million people is worth somewhere in the region of $32 billion annually. It is big business. What we are trying to do here today is to unpack that big business and to talk a little bit about the legacies of racial slavery in the United States and how that, that legacy of racial slavery has, has haunted this business of modern human bondage uh, today. Our format is really very simple. Uh, I will ask panelists that, that uh, Dean uh, McLaughlin has introduced so well to have a five-minute statement. That's what we have agreed on. 
I will try to hold them for five minutes, particularly <laughs> my lawyer friend. Uh, so for, for, for five minutes, and then I will may ask a couple of questions based on their statements, and then uh, we will want to open the, uh, the, this panel to uh, public conversation. Um, we have to be very tight with time because we have another event at three. So we have to be, get out of here by about 2.50 the latest. So again, welcome, and let me begin with the statements. Can I begin with you, Catherine? Great, thank you. Uh, first, I start with a disclaimer. So I currently work at the US Department of Health and Human Services, but I'm here today as a Brown alum, not as a representative of the US government. I just needed to start with that. Um, but it is the, uh, the topic of today's forum is um, very intimate. I'm, I feel very close to it because my introduction to uh, modern forms of slavery and human trafficking started here at Brown University. Uh, my senior year, I lived on um, Angel Street, and I remember um, about 13 years ago, almost to um, uh, this day, September 11th, and I think many of us remember where we were, and as a senior uh, student at Brown University, I was uh, walking to and then also immediately back from an art history course on campus, and the professor at the time was one of those 8 a.m. courses, and he abruptly dismissed us, and I was like, this is weird, I can now, but I'll just go back to sleep, and on my walk down uh, towards Thayer Street, I started hearing radios blaring about the events of uh, September 11th, and the reason I start with that story was because uh, my uh, journey into learning about modern forms of slavery started with a question of um, being awakened and jarred to why, why is this happening, and um, among our friends, we started having conversations around the role of religion and morality in the pursuit of violence, in the pursuit, um, but also the pursuit of social justice. So here we are today talking about the legacies of slavery, but I also want to join in there with the legacies of abolition, because Brown's history is, it goes hand in hand. Um, so in one of those dinner conversations, um, I remember asking, well, had we lived back in the day, centuries ago, when the social norms are so different, we can all sit here today and say, slavery is wrong, I oppose it, I'm an abolitionist, I would have been an abolitionist, but really had we lived back in the norms of the day, uh, when the country went to war partly around this, where would we have stood? Um, on the slave side, or the slavery uh, proponent side, because it was such an economic driving force of um, the world as we knew it, or on the abolitionist side, or in the middle, where we, maybe we think it's wrong, but we don't think it's our job to really do anything about it. So uh, friends and I started talking about this, and I remember firmly saying, well, had I lived centuries ago, I hope, given who I think I am, that I would have been on the abolitionist side. Fast forward five days, picked up a, uh, uh, the Providence Journal, and there was a story about modern form of human trafficking. In this case, there were women from um, Asia who were forced into prostitution in a massage parlor in downtown Providence, less than two miles away from where we're sitting today. So um, all, to make a very long story short, um, essentially what we decide to do at stu as students, uh, what we're, we need to figure out, we don't have a lot of expertise or knowledge about many other things in the world, but we are really good at studying and uh, building uh, relationships and getting other students uh, to learn with us. And we had um, a few professors who were very critical to um, advising us through this process, and so that's how Polaris Project, which is now a uh, global nonprofit organization fighting modern forms of slavery and human trafficking, was born here um, on campus because a group of students coupled with uh, professors, coupled with the resources of the Brown community and the alum community, um, helped to give birth uh, to this grassroots effort, and so I hope that in, I wanted to start there because it is the legacies of abolition and what we could learn from the generations that have come before us. And I look forward to having that dialogue with you and the other panelists uh, this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. So, 
I want to begin with a story as a way of unpackaging the issue of trafficking. There was a girl who was 14 years old, kidnapped from her home by a trafficker, sold to 10 different men a night. And when she could no longer take it, she tried to run. She tried to escape. And the trafficker, to make an example of her to the other girls also under his control, set her on fire in front of the other girls as a way of saying, do not dare to run. Because if you run from me, from my control, this is what happens to you. And this is not a story of trafficking that happened in Nigeria or Thailand or India or Cambodia. This is a story of a 14-year-old girl who was trafficked in Los Angeles and burned alive in Los Angeles. There are right now 100 to 200,000 American children at risk of being commercially exploited, at risk of being bought and sold for sex. The majority of them are girls between the ages of 12 to 14, middle school. And what we have recently learned from a report that was put out by the Department of Justice is that 52% of those children identified as trafficked are African-American girls. So when we talk about the issue of the legacies of slavery, so many of these girls who are being bought and sold for sex in this country, who are being propertied, are the descendants of those women enslaved during earlier chapters of our country. You know, when I was at Brown, I spent too much time hanging out with Anani and Pageant Henry and the Africana Studies Department and Rights and Reason, and spent a lot of those moments of study reading slave texts. That's where I was introduced to slave texts, the narrative. And what is profound to me is that continuing that study then into law school and trying to use slavery narrative and text as a way of understanding our laws, what is very profound is to see that there is a way that the rape of enslaved women during the antebellum South was talked about as not possible because you couldn't rape property, right? And there was the cultural imagery and language of sapphire. So the black female body through the imagery of sapphire and other cultural images of black women and girls was such that black females were over-sexualized, were too promiscuous, and therefore could not be raped. And that is some of the same languaging and sensibility that continues. So that when our girls are bought and sold, and our girls who are disproportionately black and brown, they are not necessarily seen as victims of child rape. They are called child prostitutes. Bad girls making bad decisions. Hoes and prostitutes a language that denies their victimization. And when these girls should be seen as victims of systematic child rape, and those who purchase them should be held for statutory rape, child sexual assault, none of that plays out. And so for me, the way that I understand this work as a human rights attorney, and the way that I understand the everyday realities of what trafficking is in this country is that it is a fight against gendered violence, right? Because what's happening to these girls is just the razor's edge of violence against women and girls that happens here and internationally. But I also understand the work within that larger historical arc and context of what it means to fight 
for the freedom, the full personhood, and dignity of every person in this country. And so that's the spirit that I bring to it. And it is clearly a spirit that this university exposed me to and maintained inside of me. That historical arc that uh, was so eloquently described uh, is cr critical to any understanding or any discourse which takes place, be it human trafficking now or race relations. Uh, when you see in a discussion of race, you notice that the discussions tend to go nowhere. They tend to go in circles. And one of the main reasons is because there's no context. There's no anchor to the discussion. And the reason there's no anchor in any context is because we are very reluctant to discuss the history of slavery. We're very reluctant to look at it. We're very reluctant to deal with all of its manifestations. And first of all, when you look at slavery, you have to understand that, number one, it was vicious, it was savage, and it was bestial. In spite of Gone with the Wind and D.W. Griffith and all of the other revisionist histories, that's at its baseline. And in the Slavery and Justice Report, when you read that report that was so fabulously put together by Brown University, just one example, and this was, this was not a, a, an outlier. The Brown family that was involved with the slavery, they had slave plantations in Cuba. Their sugarcane plantations, the average life expectancy of an enslaved African was seven years. Seven years. That's it. You went there at seven, you were dead at 14. At 10, you were dead at 17. So there was nothing benign about it. And it was no accident. It was very deliberate. Um, and the key to it was if, uh, one, good, one good source of seeing how it was deliberate and the, 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 the concept, when we talk about context, there was no context in terms of whether it was right or wrong. The folks knew it was wrong. Thomas Jefferson, all of them, said it was original sin. America was original sin. And Katrina Brown, who's from, her family hails from Bristol, Rhode Island, the DeWolf family, they were the largest slave trading family in the United States. And Rhode Island was the capital of slave trading. So it was no accident. And the culture, the psychological construct, which, which evolved, the, the um, uh, language, the cultural construct, those were all deliberately put together because you had to make the persons, the victims, worse than what you were doing to them. And so the, the, the language and the culture that was put together was to, had to make and justify what was being done. So what was weird is once slavery was abolished, the problem that we have is that the culture and the psychological construct persisted, never ended. And a lot of it where it's so dangerous is that what it did is it morphed into what we know is conventional wisdom. And by not looking at the history, you don't realize that. So what you have now, you have persons are able to continue to perpetuate racism. Okay, uh, The system is self-perpetuating without having any animus. You don't, have to, you don't have to have any intent to be a racist. But it's so indelibly intertwined in the fabric of our culture and our thought process that it's unknowingly done. So when you look at, for instance, uh, you look at policing. My area, as you heard for many years, is criminal defense attorney. I since retired from that, went back to the firm that I started with, doing kinder, gentler work, but I'm doing uh, civil rights and other cases. I can't stay away. You look at policing. The concept that came from slavery that a black male was inherently a dangerous individual, that persists. Police don't think they're doing anything wrong. I'm sure many of you saw the videotape of the South Carolina policeman who shot the person, shot 
multiple times after the person responded to going for his wallet, the policeman offered him to go, or ordered him to go for it. This happens continuously. And as you take my word for it, as a criminal defense attorney, I never had one case where a white male was shot who was unarmed. And the shooting of black males happens every day. So the concept that black males are inherently dangerous came from slavery, went through Jim Crow, and persists. Also, I, when talking about that, when we talk about, let's say, um, the number of black males, or so, I'm not even talking about the ones who were shot where the police officer claimed, well, I, I, I thought I, I saw that cell phone that looked like a gun or a comb that looked like a gun. I'm talking about the ones who were just flat out unarmed. They, they were just threatening. And when you look and how, why we have to look at this subject, because Katrina Brown, who did the Traces of the Trade, I suggest you see that documentary, Traces of Trade, the story from the Deep North. What she also talks about is connecting the dots. You have to connect the dots from that period because you'll see this, this legacy continue. You look at the Second Amendment arguments, show you how it just covers so many areas. Part of the Second Amendment, well, the reason this big argument, of course, it morphed into something that it never was before. But do understand that when the Second Amendment, when the framers originally came or drafted that amendment, it was to be a national militia. It was the southern states that lobbied for it to be a state militia. Why? Because they had slave patrols. Every able-bodied white male was required to serve on a slave patrol. The only people exempted, not even clergymen, the only people exempted from those slave patrols were legislators, judges, and students. Thus, every white male was empowered to dispense justice on a black person. If they found them out after hours, they were empowered to whip them after death. If they thought they were running, they had the right to use deadly force. Every white male. Thus, what do you see the legacy? George Zimmerman. He says, been wrong. He says, I'm doing what we're supposed to do. When you see somebody who looks suspicious or dangerous of a darker hue. You move from there and you go to family. And you say, all right, well, people you, I hear so often in politics, you know, it's family, the breakdown of the family. We've got to go back and look at the lineage. What is the legacy? There's a fascinating book written by uh, Heather Williams, Heather Andrea Williams, Help Me to Find My People. And in that book, she talks about the first thing that was done during slavery was to, to separate the father from his children. Because the slave owners did not want anybody to have a superior position of authority to those, those slave children than the slave owner. Now, when you look at that legacy, do you think that has an impact? And understand something about human beings. We have very short uh, uh, conscious memories, but very long subconscious memories, and they have an impact. You saw, how many, I'm sure, how many of you saw 12 Years a Slave? Yeah. And then that you recall when the, the dehumanization which had to take place, which they talk about in the Brown Report, that's the first thing that has to take place, the dehumanization of the people. When they were selling, taking that woman's child away from her, they said, oh, don't worry, you'll get, have a good night's sleep and you'll get over it. So the dehumanization, that process took place, the disruption of family, and it's had consequences. Moynihan talked about it in his report. <clears throat> At the time, even I and a lot of blacks, were, we were upset with the report. We said, what's well, but then later on when I look, I said, no, I see what he's really talking about. He's talking about the systemic factors of racism which, which came from slavery are impacting black families then, 60. And it's incumbent upon the government to begin to do things about it. You talk about medicine, you know, and health, psychological health. For so long, I sat in sensitivity sessions back during the brown days, and we would talk about what was, you know, people of goodwill were trying to come together. How can we address this racism? But we never went back dealing with the roots. And 
you would have people make all sorts of statements. You know, well, blacks are naturally happy. They don't, you know, they don't get depressed, so on and so forth. There's a book written by a fellow, John Head, Standing in the Shadows. He talks about depression in black men. And historically, the only psychological affliction which was acknowledged in this country was if an African, enslaved African tried to escape too often. That was considered a psychological condition. Nothing else. You know, the rest, the happy slave mythology had to be perpetuated because, of course, they would be treated so badly, but the idea was, no, they like it. Medicine. Now, how many people, how many African Americans know their family members who do not wish to okay, go to doctors? The, the legacy of what happened during that period, I won't even go into because it is so profound in terms of what happened to, to, to African Americans. But just, just a, blip, a glimpse, enslaved African women, when you go into Central Park, you'll see a bust of Dr. Sims, the founding father of gynecology. The way he gained all that knowledge was he engaged in experimental surgery on unanesthetized enslaved African women. And when they screamed and cried, he claimed they were just being dramatic, they didn't hurt, because Africans did not feel pain the way others did. See, the dehumanization is important. So I will wrap up, conclude, as I've gotten the, the, the signal. Just recently, we had one of my organizations in Connecticut, we brought in, uh, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. So we had um, uh, John Marshall, or 60th, of, of, of uh, 60th anniversary, John Marshall is the youngest son of Thurgood Marshall, and he gave a really great speech. And one of the things that he said, talking about, he said, you need, we need to embrace our past in order to have a foundation for the future. And he was, he was quoting a Reverend Harold Carter from Maryland. And I would go one step further and say, a knowledge and an appreciation of our past and connecting the dots that Katrina Brown talked about will enable us to overcome the challenges of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks to the three panelists. Let me ask them, <clears throat> play devil's advocate, so to speak, and ask the question. Everybody talks about connecting the dots, the abolitionists connecting the dots, connecting the dots with um, the, uh, the, the percentage of African American kids, female kids who are into um, really child rape and call child <laughs> prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Preston talks about uh, connecting the dots and all sorts of legacies of psycho you know, psychological and so on. And I asked, I, but let me play devil's advocate and ask, but what is different today from yesterday? Is there anything different? Um, people use the word slavery, modern day slavery. Are, you, are, are we talking about the way in which people, African Americans and black folks were treated then and are treated now? I mean, what is it precisely that we're talking about? Is it important to identify precisely what we're talking about when we talk about sla modern day slavery and human trafficking today? Can anyone? I, uh, one clear difference is that slavery is not legal, mm -hmm. it, at least here in the United States and in most countries. And uh, when we, in the modern anti-trafficking field, uh, we work with victims and survivors of trafficking who may be practically treated as property, but they are not legal property as people in slavery used to. Um, during the transatlantic slavery period. Mm -hmm. So from a legal perspective, uh, that's one major difference. But the techniques for recruitment, as you saw in 12 Years a Slave and Solomon Northrop's story of how he was essentially trafficked, um, deceived, and put into slavery in the South, that's, we're seeing those same techniques today around separating families and um, changing people's names and even branding people on their bodies. And th so the techniques are very similar. Legally, mm -hmm. uh, things are different. But I think we have to be mindful that it's a fraught term. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's healthy to <coughs> talk about that and challenge what 
um, what are the differences, and um, to also be clear about um, what we have learned as a country around slavery, as well as the abolitionist movement. Um, you know, I think that it's important as a modern day slavery movement, anti-modern day slavery movement, abolitionist movement, that we not replicate the mistakes of those who came before us, so that we are a movement that is representative, and we are a movement that is always critical of how we frame these issues. I think the other piece that um, I think about a lot around where I get uncomfortable with the the term modern day slavery, is that what, what I've also recognized is that it's not simply about freedom, right? So you can talk about girls who are enslaved and then the response ought to be their liberation. But it's not just the liberation that they need from enslavement. It's also the remarkable trauma that they hold because before they were trafficked, so many of them were subject to prior abuse. And that prior abuse is what made them vulnerable to being trafficked. So many of them come out of a very broken foster care system and hold the trauma of being subject to multiple placements in foster care and being raped in many of those placements. And then these same girls have gone through enduring systematic rape. And so it is going through a healing process around all of that trauma and being propertied. Mm -hmm. And trying to talk about, which we have not yet done within the public health realm, what does it mean to discuss the issue of healing and recovery, not only around sexual violence, but the experience of being propertied. Mm -hmm. I imagine that at the point of the Emancipation Proclamation, it was not a situation where everybody had their freedom and there was no issue of trauma, right? But there was no space in which there were conversations of how do we deal with trauma from enslavement. What I worry about is we miss it again so that when we talk about the need is to rescue the girls or liberate the girls, stop the enslavement, that what we will miss, and especially in terms of a public health investment, is the absolute imperative of providing girls comprehensive trauma-informed care so that they can really not only be free from a trafficker, but have a place, a chance, an opportunity for health and healing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of my concern with, with the language of enslavement is what do we miss around that? Um, and, and I think the other piece is um, if we are really going to hold ourselves as a movement to being abolitionists, then we cannot make a distinction between those who sell the slaves and those who buy the slaves. Right, because we certainly didn't make that moral or legal distinction of any sort earlier in this country's existence. Mm -hmm. And there is a tension in the anti-trafficking community around do you go after the trafficker more than the buyer? And I have claimed that if we really are going to frame this as modern day slavery, then we cannot, as real abolitionists, make any type of distinction between those who buy slaves and those who sell them. And that means that the buyers, right, the so-called Johns, that we, you know, biblical name we use to politely describe behavior that is violent, that does constitute child rape, they are buyers within this marketplace and have to be held equally accountable. And as a movement, we as abolitionists need to make that point. Yeah. Well, in terms of, uh, one of the aspects which is the same is that um, when I mentioned the DeWolf family, uh, much of the, their wealth was gained after slavery was abolished. They continued to engage in the slave trade. So uh, the similarity in terms of it was illegal at that point, and it's illegal here too. Where the times are different is 
what we have to remember is the abolitionists were basically comprised of a small group of rabble rousers and morally upright individuals, and they were very much in the minority. I think nowadays, uh, when we speak, uh, we, we have evolved to the point that most persons do not have to be persuaded that the human trafficking going on is wrong. What we do have to do, however, is in terms of analyzing and why we have to get to the roots and the historical basis of what is going on is because the language that is used in the culture, mm -hmm. just as the mention that, you know, that uh, so many of the modern day victims are looked upon not as victims. Um, and that's not by accident. The language that has been uh, uh, forged in support of modern day trafficking, if we're not careful, it's a language that allows us to slip into that same category. So we have to be very careful with the language and the culture uh, and the psychological constructs which are involved, which evolved from the original slave times and really take a look at all of that, that culture, the, the constructs, the language to make sure that we are not enabling this crime nowadays. Okay, fine. We have 10 more minutes, so let me not ask any questions, but turn it over to the, um, to the audience. Can I, can I ask if I could see about three hands and then take those three questions and then ask the panelists to answer because I think that's what we will have time for. You, sir, I recognize you. Is there, any, is there a second hand? Recognize you. Is there a third? All right, let's go with these two, please. Oh, sorry, third, are you the third? Thank you. Oh, oh sorry, let me, third, can you go third? So one, two, three, please. I think there are mics, eh? Hi, Dan, uh, class of 83. So you've talked a lot about the historical antecedents of, of arguably what is a mentality that is preventing this from being addressed. But can you be more specific in a more existential sense of of exactly who is perpetrating this and, and what could be done here and now, given history, you know, short of changing everyone's mental circuitry, which is a little ambitious, right, um, to, st to, if not stop, at least significantly attenuate this problem here and now. Okay, right. Second question. I guess my question is very similar. Um, since what we're talking about is a very difficult uh, uh, issue, what can the average person now who is aware of all of these atrocities, what can the average person do to start that movement of change? Okay, final question. Fox Boyle with you for Public Health. My question has to do with the cultural um, uh, beliefs of women as chattel and property in subcultures and how that feeds into this larger. Okay. Thank you very much. We have about seven minutes to respond to the two okay. panelists. Uh, I'll uh, provide some quick responses in terms of um, F what you can do. Uh, so slavery is so diverse, modern forms of slavery are so diverse. We're talking about various forms of labor trafficking, sex trafficking, Malika mentioned a, a few scenarios there. And uh, essentially it is a market-driven industry, and what we need to do as a global community is segment each different market to figure out how do we um, disrupt the dynamics that allow slavery in uh, rubber plantations to flourish in certain parts of the world, et cetera. Um, so part of some, um, some of the work that's going on, corporations having uh, increasingly been engaged on the labor trafficking supply chain side, uh, the way the global economy works is so interconnected that you can't just slice off a trade route from one country to another on a certain supply and think you can get rid of slavery these days because it's just um, much more networked and um, uh, nuanced th than that. Uh, but corporate supply, uh, corporations have been looking into their supply chains. The federal government, um, uh, there is an executive order that passed to um, 
uh, try to prevent slavery in anything that the federal government procures through any of its spending. And so the, we'll, we see more of that from corporate engagements. Uh, we see faith-based communities um, continuing to be involved in uh, the modern day, whether uh, they're providing support or direct services in their local communities through houses, shelter, food programs, mentoring, um, education programs. Um, and then the other thing that we do is uh, uh, leverage the networks of technology uh, that we have um, today that wasn't present back in the day. So uh, we see um, the use of hotlines and texting where uh, victims and survivors of trafficking are calling directly looking for help, uh, law enforcement or neighbors who see suspicious activity um, or know someone who needs help are calling um, hotlines around the world, um, texting in certain parts of the world, including here in the United States, so where the average community member, what you can do is post information about where, um, in public places, uh, where people can receive assistance, additional training, because we need everyone trained from not just faith-based communities, educators, um, healthcare providers, law enforcement, and wherever you are in your uh, professional associations or careers or neighborhoods, um, there are ways to get engaged either professionally or at the grassroots level by raising awareness in key um, uh, frontline responder communities. So I want to take your question, and I want to take it from a US-based perspective, which is that we have to go after demand. We have to go after the demand for children. Um, you know, we have a culture of impunity around buying sex with children. And in the same way that 20 years ago, the domestic violence movement named that when a husband hits his wife, that is not a private matter or a personal dispute. That is an act of violence. We have to do the same here. When an individual purchases a child for sex, that is an act of violence. That is child rape. And that individual has to be held accountable. At present, we don't see that in any consistent way. If buyers are ever arrested, they're arrested for solicitation, not statutory rape, not sexual assault of a minor, not in child endangerment. Even though what that individual has done to that girl in any other context would be considered statutory rape. But something happens that when the rape is purchased, it is considered less an act of crime. And so part of this is that we have to name it as a crime as violence, and we have to see law enforcement and our prosecutors reshaping their understanding of these children and of what's playing out. And that means an incredible amount of hard work from everyday folks to push that, whether they are in the circles of law enforcement, whether they are lawyers, judges, and voters, I will tell you, we, we, right now, we work on the Hill, right? And I've had a long year of trying to pass the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. And what that act does is it requires that all these anti-trafficking task forces that we have all over the country, that they not only go after the traffickers, but required to go after the buyers. And there's something in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act known as um, Section 1591. And it's what a lot of the prosecutors use to go after the traffickers. And our bill says, wait a second, that's not just about the traffickers. It clarifies that that Section 1591 is also to be applied to the buyers. It has been a long year of trying to convince our lawmakers to pass that. And I will be very frank with you in saying that the Republicans have been unbelievable allies. Um, you know, I had to push the Democrats along a little bit more <laughs> um, because I think there's some tensions there in the progressive community. We passed that bill out of the House unanimously. And now it is in the Senate. It was passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee unanimously. But we're waiting to get it put to the Senate floor. 
We need people's voices on this. Our lawmakers need to understand that this is a priority and that we want to see this kind of change culture. It is very similar to what the domestic violence movement did 20 years before. I think the other piece in terms of what folks can also do, in addition to what I've mentioned, is that I often talk to girls who are victims and survivors. And the survivors will say, you know, when I was out there, if I knew that I could have escaped into a church or a school, and I would have been safe, if that could have been my underground railroad, my safe house, there would have been opportunities to be free. And so I think that's another way for us to think about what is our role, our everyday role as abolitionists in being able to name what is happening and being able to see what are the resources that we can bring to bear to create our own modern day type of underground railroad. Preston, you have the final word? Okay. I would say that in our, our, each of our individual spheres, what we can do is to question, question, question all stereotypes and all um, generalizations which you know through your intellect are designed to uh, victimize members of our community. I think that um, uh, as the, because it's the culture, the psychological culture that, that empowers or, uh, or enables these sorts of, of, of criminal, criminalized activities to gain traction and to not be addressed in the serious manner in which it needs to be addressed. So I would say you have to critically uh, analyze and listen to all uh, information which comes your way. And another note, I mean, I think one very simple one, and you know, is racial profiling. That's a different different uh, sphere, but just to give you an example of what you can look at, racial profiling is bad policing. It does not. What it does is it targets. Uh, innocence as well as guilty. It means you waste resources on the minnows instead of the sharks. And also in terms of policing for the community, just like these victims, for anybody to be able to go to the police, they have to feel that they will be treated fairly. And if in a community you do not feel you're being treated fairly, you will not go to them. And police cannot do their jobs unless the community cooperates. So if the police are operating like the military, which their objective is to destroy and to defeat, as opposed to police officers, where they're supposed to keep the peace, then you cannot get to the underlying problem of any criminal activity. So I, all of us have great spheres of influence, and you need to take your intellect and your goodwill and share that with all of your spheres of influence. Can we give a round of applause to the panel? <laughs> Can I just say thank you very much to all three of you. Can I thank the audience uh, um, really for, uh, for being here and for asking the, the, the three questions. And uh, can I all invite you to walk over to the um, dedication of the memorial. Thank you all very much. Thank you.